Hey folks, Tim Miller here. It is good to be back with you. I first want to say thanks to everybody. Uh, your encouragement has been amazing. I've got a very kind people talking to me about how to stay healthy and all kinds of great recommendations for the channel. And I'm just very appreciative. I want to let you know the reason I'm not here is our team's doing some pretty cool things. Um, what we do is help equip and prepare organizations. And that's everything from Fortune 500 companies to churches and schools and all kinds of folks. Um, because we believe that challenging times are here and are going to increase. And so we want to be an organization that with high levels of skill, but also high levels of uh, integrity and faith, communicate uh, how people can be wise and prepared. Remember, the three things so critical now, wise, uh, prepared, and alert to all that's going on. So I hope, uh, folks, that you're doing well as we go into this uh, holiday season. Uh, I did want to just kind of give you uh, a real quick lesson today. Uh, I know many of you have said, hey, Tim, we'd like to do lives. We're going to start doing that. I need your help, though. If you could jump on to the lives and uh, and help me get it going, that'd be great. Because, folks, I, I think you know this, but I don't have any aspirations. I don't want to be a big great YouTube star. I've, I've had my opportunity to do things in the national media spotlight. Um, and, and what I want to do is help keep people alive. I hope and pray that the information you receive here, I always tell organizations, my hope and prayer is that we give you the best information. We do it the best interaction uh, methods possible. And then we leave you with inspiration. So the best information, best interaction, and best inspiration. And so that's where your chat comments are so important. If you could just weigh in and go, hey, yeah, what about this? Or, hey, why do you, why do you say that? That would be great because I want to make sure that we're always giving you skills. And by the way, for those of you who stood and made your voice heard and you voted and extra exercised your constitutional right, I couldn't be more proud of you or honored to stand with you. Let me tell you, folks. Our country is in serious trouble. For those of you who think that the election went and now everything's going to come up roses, we're just starting. And what does that mean to you? Well, as people of principle and integrity, you need to stand. Never again should we be told in this country how to parent our kids, how uh, to spend tax dollars for just purely evil things, uh, how to you know, uh, not be able to speak your First Amendment rights in public meetings. And, and the only way those rights are going to be guarded and protected is if you stand for them. And so thank you for standing. Thank you for those of you who went. And, you know, I even say on either side, if you went and voted, then you participated in the process of democracy, which is huge. Now, remember, folks, please remember, there are a lot of, of channels on the YouTube that are spinning things only in one direction. Now, the question for us is, is the direction towards righteousness and good or towards evil and destruction? And those are the two, you know, pathways. It's kind of a why in the road. So I hope and pray that you are motivated. And some say, well, what do I do? Well, you get involved. Even if you're a grandparent, go to school board meetings, stand and speak. For those of you who are people of faith, when, when you know that what's being proposed is something directly opposed to what the Lord tells us to do, stand. If you're on social media, stand. Now, please hear me. I don't mean antagonize. I don't mean criticize. I don't mean fight. I mean stand. Folks, if we don't stand for truth these days, I promise you evil will stand in its place. So we must be wise, prepared at every level, not just security. So I want to take you to an incident. Um, for those of you who have watched uh, a lot of my videos, you know, I always preach that security incidents can happen just like that. Most of the time unexpected. We normally don't get a text that says, hey, you're going to be involved in a crime. You're going to be in a natural disaster. You're going to be in a situation, a car accident. It doesn't work that way. So for this one, it comes to us from Louisiana. And I want you to picture you're literally, uh, you've been out late 
and you're, you're looking at uh, going home, but then you decide it's two o'clock in the morning and you decide you're going to stop and you're going to do a car wash real quick. Like, well, let's take a look at that and uh, let's see how that goes. It's 2 a.m. in Shreveport, Louisiana, and Michael Davis is washing his car at a local car wash while his brother Millard, a disabled veteran, sits in the passenger seat. And while washing your car might seem like a relatively relaxing late night activity, the situation is about to become potentially deadly. The first guy that I saw was the guy that was off camera. I just assumed it was somebody panhandling. I turned to him and I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any money or anything. When I turned around, his accomplice had the gun set up on me. It's a carjacking and Michael and his brother inside the car are caught completely off guard. Once I turned around and I saw the gun was pointed at my face, I needed to address the primary threat, which was the person with the gun. Incredibly, the powerful jet of water drives the man with the gun and his accomplice away the biggest motivator for me was saving my brother i mean you know cars and things like that could be replaced but you know uh people can't but it's not over yet i immediately jump into my car and my thought was you know launch out of there and chase them down the car wash hose however has other ideas when I dropped the, the sprayer, it went under the front of my car. So if I would have went forward, it would have, you know, drug the whole thing down from my car. So I decided to put it in reverse instead. But once I got back into the car wash stall, I went to the front and I said, hey, you come back and try it again. But they don't come back. And that's when Michael makes perhaps his boldest choice of the night. <laughs> The police were on the way, and I figured while I'm waiting for the police, I might as well go ahead and just finish rinsing my car. That's what I came here for anyway. So, folks, there it is. You're doing a car wash at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it just happens. You have two people that come up to you. Now, Now, let me be clear, because I'm sure if you're like me, some of you are saying, wait, wait a minute, 2 o'clock in the morning, doing a car wash at 2 o'clock in the morning, and it just happens. You have two people that come up to you. Now, Now let me be clear, because I'm sure if you're like me, some of you are saying, wait, wait a minute, two o'clock in the morning, what are you doing at the car wash? That would be a great question. What I would remind you of, I have no empirical data to suggest this is 100% true, but what's open at two o'clock in the morning that you're leaving to come home? Well, if you notice some of the actions that Michael took, uh, it could have been motivated by a uh, foreign substance in his bloodstream. <laughs> and I don't have to go any further than that. Let me just say this. I think Michael uh, really responded in a way um, that, uh, you know, he thought appropriate at the time. Uh, he had a disabled uh, brother in the vehicle. It was a carjacking. He wasn't going to let that happen. So he made the choice to go ahead and take aggressive action. But let's do like we always do. And let's start at the beginning and say, okay, before the incident, are there lessons we could learn uh, so that remember pro security is proactive, meaning we're always looking to make incidents like this not happen. Well, how do we do that, Tim? Well, we're alert, aware, trained and prepared, alert, aware, trained and prepared. So if you think about a two o'clock in the morning car wash, um, it's likely at 2 a.m. that nobody's going to be around. And if they are around, you have to ask the question, why? Now, why does this matter so much? Because folks, you may not you know, get out and do a car wash at two in the morning, but you may stop by that convenience store late at night because you need that gallon of milk. And now you just pull in and let me ask you, do you pull in with your phone in your hand? Hey, you know, are you watching, texting? Uh, just walk in the front door. Let me, let me give you a good rule of thumb. Wherever you go late at night, take that few minutes 
and be alert and aware. You can see usually both ends of a convenience store. Do you see people lurking around the corner? Do you see anybody out at that night, time of night? Do you see people sitting in a vehicle seemingly just watching? Folks, if you can ID that on the front end, then guess what? You may save your life and the life of others. Never, we learn this in law enforcement, you never get out of a car and just walk in a store at that time of night because you never know what's waiting. And if there's a robbery in progress, you're going to quickly become a victim. So remember too, it's, it's critical that we're not going in distracted. We don't have our phone. We don't have headphones. I've seen people walk out of their car with headphones in and walk in. That means you can't hear anything. So alert, aware. Now, if you think of the car wash situation, there was a guy that came up to Michael and Michael immediately did something that could have cost him his life. He discarded or discounted the, the fact this guy was coming up to him, although the guy was dressed very unusually and the guy came out of nowhere, Michael assumed he was a homeless guy begging for money. Folks, this happens in human beings. It's called normalcy bias, meaning that a person uh, in, in a circumstance where they may think something is wrong, your brain can communicate to you that nothing's wrong, everything's great, and so therefore you discount it. There's, and by the way, this is researched data that has recently, uh, you know, come to light. But there have been instances where people have sat on planes with the plane on fire. But they didn't move, didn't respond because normalcy bias told them that everything was fine. Folks, that's a training of the mind to make sure you are allowing the facts to tell you what's going on and not just this normalcy bias thing of, well, everything will be okay. If you want to YouTube uh, search some of this information, it's pretty fascinating. But so we don't assume, as Michael did, oh, he just wants money. Now we're already in the planning process, and we've talked about OODA loop on the channel before, how the human body responds to a conflict and how quick, quickly, um, you know, it, it, it's, it is, um, it's so important that we're able able to assess those four things for OODA loop. Again, that's a take-home assignment. Observe, orient, decide, act. Folks, when we're training law enforcement or military, this is a key mental process that if a person is practicing on a regular basis, it means you're game ready when things, even unexpected things happen. So again, normalcy bias, practicing the OODA loop, that's the mental preparation. So beforehand, we want to observe it. We want to watch it. Remember, as you're watching people, uh, most of a person's intentions are communicated through their body language. Some psychiatrists estimate that up to 80 to 90 percent of a person's true emotions are communicated through body language. So be Become people watchers. Watch what people do. And I know that there are some of you that go, Tim, I'm not this MMA fighter. I'm older, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you, some of the best observers I know are older people that have developed this skill over time because they can see things evolving even before others. Younger people don't have the experience. So beforehand, we're going to be alert and aware. One of the things I always recommend, whether it's a convenience store or a situation like this at a car wash, drive around the facility, cover the area, pay attention. Look, you know you're going to be trapped in a bay there for a good 20 to 30 minutes washing a car. Don't do it blind. Don't allow yourself just to, you know, mosey on in there without paying attention. So that's number one, um, you know, before. What do we do before? We're careful, we're, we're, we're observant, and we make sure that we're not going blind into anywhere. And so then we get to the during the conflict. Now, this is pretty fascinating because um, many of you have heard, oh, run, hide, fight, run, hide, fight. The problem with an act of violence or a criminal event, if you adopt that mindset, run, hide, fight, you're going to flow right into a formula instead of a pattern of options. Um, options being, uh, in some cases, you may run. In some cases, you may hide. In some cases, you may fight. 
But here's the point, folks. If you've thought through those options, then you're much more likely to be the one that goes right into the right choice in the midst of that. So what was Michael facing? Well, he was being carjacked. Remember, carjacked. He's got a disabled brother in the front seat. Uh, he, he's not sure that, um, you know, if, if he gave up the uh, the car keys or whatever they were looking for, that his brother wouldn't be hurt. So within split seconds, he says, no, I'm going to fight. Well, he had the presence of mind to look into his hands and go, wait a minute, I got a pretty good weapon here. A high pressure washer filled with soapy water is about as good as it gets if you want to disable someone's uh, ability to attack you by spraying that into their eyes. Now, some of you may say, well, he had sunglasses on. He does. But if you hit that and you know that, uh, if you hit that high pressure spray, it's going to get in your eyes. Anybody that's been in the shower with soap, you know that that's going to cause you to go, oh man, you're not going to be able to see. So Michael very quickly and calculatedly hits the first suspect right in the eyes. Now, is that dangerous? Yeah. He's one slight five and a half pound trigger press away from being shot. The weapon's there. The good news is, is Michael does it, but he does it fluidly. He aims it and he does it. Then he pivots to the second guy that's becoming aggressive, does the same thing. Now, this is where good job, Michael, pat on the back stops, because at this point, you've got both suspects retreating. But then again, Michael may have something in his bloodstream that initiates false courage. And he runs out, hey, and he starts mocking them. Folks, <laughs> in the middle of a crisis, whatever you do, don't do that. Because those folks right now are in the flight mode. But it doesn't mean they're afraid of you. It means that they're trying to regroup. Now, if you were to say the right thing that triggers somebody that's high on drugs, that's already amped, and now he's like, oh, you're going to say that to me? It could cause him to turn right back around and come right back at you. Well, that's all great, but you can't fight him off with that hose uh, too terribly longer, too much longer. So Michael begins to run back to his car. Great call. Why? If you notice, the second suspect pauses, but then he takes off. He doesn't know what Michael's got in that car. He may think Michael's going in that car to retrieve a weapon. He don't want any part of that. So that keeps him in the flight mode. But folks, remember, when the incident is, the tactical element of the incident is over, you got to cover and evacuate what we would call in the Secret Service. You got to get to a safe place and then you can do the other things that need to be done. So that's the only piece of the during piece that I would say not a good call. And then he's going to jump in his car and he's going to pursue him. That's like felony dumb. At that point, you want the police there as quickly as possible. Probably staying there and washing your car, not the wisest choice. But again, Sometimes stuff in your veins can cause false courage. I suspect that what may be happening two o'clock in the morning coming back. And so I'll leave it there. But then let's get to the uh, the end, uh, the after the incident. And this is where, folks, we really can learn some things. So in this case, no one was hurt or injured. Uh, the good news is, is the police are going to come in and they're going to ask you what happened and you're going to be able to fully tell them exactly what happened. But let's say it was a it was a more violent incident. Let's say that you had to utilize some kind of serious force. And now the police are saying what happened. Listen to me carefully. For those of you who have not had training realistic training for how to manage a crisis incident where you employ force or even deadly force, you need to know this. When you're in a traumatic situation, your brain gets scrambled. If you're trained and prepared, you can perform the actions needed in the middle of that. But at the end, your brain is trying to regroup because your brain's been through a certain level of, tra of trauma. If you're not trained, and even if you are trained, depending on the gravity of the situation, it can really cause your brain not to remember things accurately. So for those of you who carry tools, who train with tools on the ranges, remember what you do when police arrive 
may make the difference between you spending a lot of time in jail or you not necessarily having any serious trouble. Here's what I mean. When the officers arrive, you need to give them enough information so that they know what you did was legally justified. Meaning you look at them and say, hey, uh, a guy came up to me in this case. He produced a weapon. He ordered me to to give give him my car. Uh, I had this in my hand. I utilized it towards his eyes. And that was it. Well, guess what? If that happens, then the officers are going to want more information. At that point, if you're wise, if you're involved in a serious critical incident, I always advise you, tell them, hey, you know, this has been very traumatic. I don't do this every day like you guys do. I want to go to the hospital. I want to get checked out. And then I'll be happy to cooperate later uh, to provide additional information. Research has shown, folks, if you have any questions about it, look up the Four Sciences Institute. They're the ones that actually train law enforcement officers how to manage uh, critical incidents. Uh, they do cutting edge research on the brain and the and, and how the mind functions. They do de-escalation training and how to identify um, uh, behavioral issues um, that could indicate violence. They're just amazing. But the bottom line is they basically uh, uh, suggest that your brain needs about two full sleep cycles before it can restore normal memories into their accurate files. So, folks, let me just say this. If, if you learn nothing else from this, if you have a tool and you carry that tool and it's a personal protective tool, remember Please remember that if you have to use it those minutes right afterwards, because here's what's going to happen. You're going to want to justify why you did what you did. And certainly you have to give them enough information to where they know you just weren't you know, doing something grossly illegal. But once you do that, then you need to go ahead and allow yourself to regenerate, recuperate, get a couple sleep under your belt, and then you can answer questions. So, folks, I hope um, this information is helpful. By the way, I want to reiterate what I've told you in prior um, uh, videos in terms of it, exactly what you do initially if you're confronted by any kind of crisis, but especially a violent crisis, active violence, but also it could be a weather emergency where you have to act, you have to act now. Remember what we talked about, speak and breathe, speak and breathe. Remember the research I told you about. We now have clinical research that suggests that your words spoken initially in the midst of a crisis situation can either calm your mind and your body or it can cause your mind and body to, to panic. And that's based on what you say. If you speak positive words, hey guys, we're gonna be fine, we're gonna be okay. Likely, you not only will calm yourself, but you'll calm others. Panic is contagious. So remember, speak positive words. You can run through this in your mind uh, while you're rehearsing mentally some of the things um, for your emergency plan. So just picture an event and just say, okay, what, what would I say? Hey, guys, we're going to be okay. Let's go. The tornado's coming, whatever, but we're going to be okay. Remember, speak, but then breathe. And remember, I told you what law enforcement's trained to do. You need to be trained to do it as well. Again, to avoid panic, you need to do what's called box breathing. You breathe in through your nose for four seconds. You hold it for four seconds. Breathe out through your mouth for four seconds. Hold it for four seconds. And you repeat that process because what you're doing, you're equipping your mind to think with the oxygen it needs and your body to respond with the oxygen that needs. You'll keep your organs pumping and flowing versus when you go into panic, you begin restricting blood flow, and that can be fatal. So remember, folks, these are things that you can practice driving down the highway. You can practice during the day. Remember that uh, mental rehearsal is huge. Creating those emergency files is huge. And folks, let me tell you, you need to do this because... If you're able to maintain composure, be calm, collected, and able to respond, 
not only are you going to be able to save yourself and your family, but you may be able to save a whole lot of other uh, innocent people that desperately need your help. Now, remember, this is an all call for everybody. And I've had older folks go, you don't understand. You know, I use a walker or whatever. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Wherever you are, you are. But you can still be a tremendous tool. But what I've learned through the years is whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. Folks, it's important. We all need to be part of the army of righteousness in our country to stand for things that matter, to stand for our country. One day we will be held accountable uh, by our family, and but more importantly, through our Lord. So let me just encourage you. I hope this is helpful. Uh, remember, like, sharing, subscribing. Also, any recommendations you have on material you'd like to see uh, me cover. I hope these are helpful. I'm going to try to do more. I promise. I apologize for the sporadic uh, videos that I do, but I hope what I'm training you in is helpful. And I hope you'll share it, especially with young people. Folks, we need a culture of young people that are willing to stand. And let me just be honest, I'll, I'll digress for a second. When I see what's happening to Daniel Penny in New York City, it just rocks my world. You have a person who is a violent felon, who is mentally unstable. And let me tell you, my heart goes out for him. I've dealt with a lot of folks like him, but he's crossed the bridge into violently threatening and intimidating others. And now I know there are going to be some that are going to go, oh, that's just crazy. That man killed him. No, you know, if you know anything about tactical restraints, you know that it's not a science when you begin to put people in certain holds. Uh, you run the risk. It, it just kind of is what it is because you're around areas of blood flow. You run the risk of, you know, having what happened happen. But I do believe, folks, we don't want a culture of cowardice men standing around watching stuff happen. And that's my fear. Uh, I would argue that evil loves it when good men do nothing. And so you got to decide for yourself. I know I've decided for myself whether I'm going to get involved, how I get involved. Let me just say this. I'm not looking to get involved. That's the last thing I want to do. But if a person's life depends on it, if a person's going to be uh, hurt or severely injured, I don't think I have a choice. Maybe it's the Marine in me. Maybe it's law enforcement in me but I just can't stand by and watch it. So anyway, I hope and pray that you're developing the mental skills, the alertness skills, the reading, the body language skills, the tactical skills, all the things that we need to make sure, like my friend Chuck says, that wherever we go, people are safer because of it. So I hope this is helpful. I hope and pray that you have a blessed holiday season. Keep comments coming. Thank you for them. Thank you for your prayers and encouragement. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Stay safe out there. God bless you. Happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas.